Developing countries are disproportionately impacted by international tax competition and profit shifting. In this second session, another group is going to discuss the issues and concerns that are specific to these countries and their participation and collaboration in international tax reform. To moderate this session, let me introduce you to Martin Hearson. He is a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, where he's an international tax program lead for the International Center for Tax and Development. Mr. Uh, Martin Harrison is also, um, his research actually focuses on the politics of international business taxation, and in particular, the relationship between developed and developing countries. Before joining ICT, Martin was a fellow in international political uh, economy at LSE, the London School of Economics and Political Science. So without further ado, uh, Martin, I will leave the floor to you. Thank you very much to Tax Co-op uh, for this uh, invitation. Um, so we're, um, uh, we're going to spend the next hour uh, in a discussion um, about the role about developing countries and um, international taxation. Um, and we have for that discussion two giants of taxation in Africa. We have Professor Annette Agutu and um, Mary Baini. I'll introduce them uh, one by one as they speak. And after that, we have um, a panel of rising stars in uh, international taxation. Um, uh, ten people, all of whom um, will have really interesting perspectives to bring on those presentations we're going to get. Um, so I see that um, I, Annette is um, going to be up speaking first. So um, uh, Professor Annette Agutu is Professor of Tax Law in the Department of Taxation and at the African Tax Institute at the University of Pretoria. She's also a member of the High Level Panel on Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity. Um, so Annette has been a um, commentator on international tax issues in, uh, from an African perspective for uh, uh, many years. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing what she has to say. Over to you, Professor Ogutu. Thank you, Martin, for that kind introduction, and thank you for tax Cop, uh, to TaxCorp for the invitation. Well, the topic I was given to talk about is reforming international taxation, participation, and collaboration. And here are my views on the matters. Historically, countries viewed the development of domestic international tax laws as a matter for each sovereign state to attend to and in making these decisions too often little or no account was taken of either the impact that domestic laws had on other countries or the impact that the laws of other countries had on them However, the tax laws and policies of one country can adversely affect another country's ability to collect tax that is due to them. So you find that over the years, various measures have been taken to ensure <coughs> international cooperation, <coughs> sorry about that, in tax matters. As the international community embarks on international tax form in light of the digital economy, participation and collaboration of all countries in the norm setting is therefore of utmost importance. Let us consider participation first. When the OECD embarked on the project to address BEPS, which occurs when multinationals make use of gaps in the interaction of different tax systems to shift profits low tax jurisdictions in which there is little or no economic activity, it is acknowledged that international participation was needed to address BEPS as it constitutes a serious risk to tax revenues, tax sovereignty, and tax fairness for all countries. So when the OECD issued <clears throat> its BEPS action plan in 2013, it stated that in order to ensure international consensus in addressing BEPS, it will take into account the perspectives of developing countries. However, in the drafting of the initial BEPS agenda, developing countries were not consulted on the agenda, and it was driven by the interests of developed countries, and it largely reflected solutions to eliminate BEPS issues that mainly concerned this group of countries. Thus, you find that the initial drafting failed to acknowledge uh, that even though BEPS is a global concern, the nature of BEPS concerns is not uniform, 
for all countries, and that certain PEPs schemes that work to undermine the European or American tax base often do not coincide with the developing country paradigm. The UN stressed that efforts in international tax corporations should be universal in approach and scope and should fully take into account the different needs and capacities of all countries, in particular, least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, small island developing states, and African countries. The African Tax Administration Forum noted that the development of rules for global taxation should address the concerns of all countries and it should be inclusive to ensure that international tax rules can be applied effectively by developed, emerging and developing countries. By the time that the final reports were issued in 2015, effort had been taken to involve developing countries and their BEPS concerns, such as those relating to transfer pricing of commodities, were included in the BEPS action measures. Particular developing country concerns, such as tax incentives and simplified methods for arriving at an arm's length price, were addressed inside projects as toolkits issued by the G20 Development Working Group and the Platform for Collaboration on Tax. Issues regarding capacity constraints of developing countries have also been addressed through collaborative efforts under initiatives like the Tax Inspectors Without Borders. When the final PEPs reports were issued in 2015, developing countries expressed strong interest for continued participation to be sustained by the establishment of a more inclusive framework. Acknowledging that globalization requires global solutions, the OECD set up an inclusive framework to foster global dialogue on BEPS and to monitor the implementation of BEPS minimum standards with all interested parties, developed and developing countries, participating on an equal footing. So many developing countries are involved, currently 25 from Africa, including international organizations such as the UN and regional organizations in Africa such as CREDAV and ATAV that have been involved in the BEPS working parties. The question, however, is whether developing countries have effectively participated in the inclusive framework. Although the inclusive framework avails developing countries the opportunity to engage with developed countries on an equal footing, there are concerns that the platform does not necessarily enhance equitable participation. The experience of some developing countries is that it creates an environment for them to be present without actually experiencing participation on an equal footing. Voluntary cooperation in a system is not not in itself proof that the system benefits all of its participants. It is common knowledge that some of the flaws of international platforms include strategic interactions and agenda setting by key actors, the prevalence of networked solutions to get fast maneuver advantages that impose externalities on other countries, and the asymmetries between countries that tilt playing field in favor of stronger actors. Often, while such strategic positions are being taken, many developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America lack the resources to keep sending officials to attend the many meetings that are, attended, that are held in Europe and are easily accept, accessed by developed countries. Most developing countries have a handful of officials that work on international tax matters who are often seized with other domestic priorities besides attaining the international or to the international obligations. If you consider the speed of the process, it often gets uh, it, the speed of the process often gets them overstretched and overwhelmed, which hampers their ability to fully engage on an equal footing with developed countries. It's therefore important that the OECD fosters an environment where the unique circumstances of developing countries are acknowledged and where the real issues that are at stake from their perspective are discussed. 
Collaboration requires that countries work together to set the norms for international taxation and that these norms are respected by all countries and even-handedness is applied to all countries that do not comply with the norms. Take, for example, the rules regarding automatic exchange of information in tax matters. Even though many developing countries face capacity constraints in complying with the requirements, a good number of them have enacted relevant legislation, signed treaties, put in place confidentiality requirements, and have gone through the OECD global uh, forum peer reviews, and some of them were found to be compliant or largely compliant. Although some developing countries have benefited from this process, the experience of many is that there is no guarantee that information will be actually provided to them, as there is little confidence from developed countries that some developing countries will ensure confidentiality of that information or meet the standards for data protection to protect the sensitive business information. Thus, you find that requests for exchange of information or, or, or assistance in collection of taxes are often ignored or rejected. A Zambian Revenue uh, Authority official is reported as having said, if you ask once, you don't get a result, you don't ask twice. In such cases, the OECD Global Forum does not provide measures of recourse for countries that feel that treaty partners are not complying with their commitments. But when it comes to non-compliance with the OECD recommendations to curtail harmful tax practices, developed countries have the clout to impose sanctions or blacklist non-compliant countries. The OECD, for example, maintains a list of non-cooperative tax havens, and since 2017, the uh, European Council prepares a list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes, which are subject to certain sanctions like uh, reduced access to uh, funding from EU countries. What is concerning is that the EU blacklists uh, criteria includes countries that have not implemented the OECD inclusive framework minimum standards, even though uh, members of the inclusive framework, membership to inclusive framework is supposed to be voluntary. Coercion from the EU to comply with the BEPS minimum standards, which it did not set, is undesirable for international collaboration. And then the blacklisting of small African countries like Namibia, Cape Verde, Iswatini, which was, um, uh, uh, which one was it, by the way? Uh, oh, well, let's leave that for now. Blacklisting of such small African countries, some of them have been put in the gray list or delisted, which uh, poses a dire need for foreign direct investment for these countries, impacting on their reputation in the eyes of other countries and even potential investors. And yet the threat to BEPS that such small countries pose cannot be compared to that that is posed to by historical European tax havens like uh, Netherlands and Switzerland. Well, let me stop here and let's hear what the others have got to say on the topic. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you very much, Annette, for that um, informative and challenging presentation. Um, and now we'll move on to uh, comments from Mary Baina. So Mary is um, the Director of, Inter of Tax Programs at the African Tax Administration Forum. Um, ATAF is one of the um, most vocal organizations um, speaking on behalf of developing countries in international tax negotiations. So it's really great that we have Mary here. She uh, she was previously um, in the Rwandan government as permanent secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as commissioner general of the Rwanda Revenue Authority. So she speaks also with uh, experience from a lower income country. So over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Martin. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be uh, speaking to all of you today. And um, as Martin has said, I will talk, you know, from the perspective of ATAF as uh, an administration that deals uh, with uh, developing countries in Africa, and also from my past experience at the, at the Rwanda Revenue Authority. And I've been asked to talk about um, 
the issues in international taxation for developing countries and how these are similar or different among developing countries. And I've broken my uh, discussion in about four or five questions and uh, I will uh, then uh, also take you through some of the challenges at the regional, that regional and international uh, tax cooperation could address if uh, well done. So I'll start with the issues and concerns related to international taxation for developing countries. And uh, I would like to say that uh, it is it would be difficult to talk about international taxation without actually talking about BEPS and uh, what the process has achieved or what uh, or the areas where you know, countries are still struggling. So many countries consider that international tax rules have in recent years undergone the most fundamental change in decades due to the G20 OECD base erosion and profit shifting project. Uh, and we know now that uh, after five years, the view of most of the African countries, at least the view of our membership, is that the project has not and will not stem illicit financial flows like we can though hoped you know, at the start. And this is really for a number of reasons that I'll be going into in the course of my, uh, of my speech. Furthermore, it did not address the most fundamental concern of African countries, which is really the current imbalance in the allocation of taxing rights, which is unfairly uh, weighted in favor of residence countries to the detriment of source countries. Of course, um, uh, I'll be quick to add that um, from the outset, the project, the BEPS project wasn't really, was very clear that its objective was not to consider the issue of allocation of taxing rights, but was to address the deficiencies in the international tax rules that enable base erosion and profit shifting um, strategies to be implemented uh, so as uh, not to allow MNEs to exploit uh, or reduce their tax liabilities. However, the BEPS actions have had a very limited effect on addressing such profit shifting strategies in Africa, as the rules are in many cases too complex, like we just heard from Professor Ogutu. So since the end of the BEPS project, the focus at the uh, inclusive framework has been on dealing with tax challenges largely with the digitized economy. Now, initially, the challenges under the BEPS project were complex. The ones in the uh, debates uh, on digitization of the economy are even more complex. So like Annette said, due to the capacity issues, there really are serious concerns uh, in terms of capacity to even apply uh, minds and apply uh, enough resources to address these issues. That work aims to change the rules to address the fact that the current rules were not designed for the taxation of business models, whereby a foreign enterprise can reach into and carry out business in a jurisdiction without having any physical presence in that jurisdiction. So what ATAF and its members have, uh, have been doing is to try and work, and we do recognize that changes are needed to the international tax rules and consider that a global consensus based solution uh, while most preferable, may not be able to be achieved in the near future. And we have been on record to say this several times. However, given the multiple diverging versions, it is very, very clear that there are serious doubts that this process will reach a global consensus uh, best solution anytime soon. And during our participation at the meetings over the past two years, it is clear that the initial issues that were uh, looked at at BEPS were actually uh, slightly less than the e key issues that are now uh, being uncovered under the, the, the global debate. The, as the key issues crystallize, the views of countries are becoming more and more divergent and the gaps to be bridged are increasing. And of course, this is typified by some of the examples. For instance, the example of the USA in December, uh, when they requested that the rules for taxing digital companies should be on a so-called safe harbor basis, whereby MNEs can opt out of the rules, making the tax voluntary, which is uh, actually uh, rendering it ineffective. So even if a consensus can be reached, and many Africans and other developing countries consider this uh, to be uh, a bit far off, uh, um, this is not likely to address the key tax issues facing Africa. In particular, the imbalance of the allocation of taxing rights uh, hasn't really been addressed in, um, 
in, in, in the proposals on the table. If this is not addressed uh, in the proposal, then uh, this will actually be really, really sad because uh, everybody had looked to this process as an opportunity for this imbalance to be addressed. Secondly, in um, the Pillar 2 proposal, which is supposed to address the BEPS issues, uh, when you look at what is on the table, for example, the minimum effective tax rate in the rule is, if, if the rule is likely to be much lower than the statutory corporate income tax rate, meaning that um, for many countries, it will not change anything. It will not be a deterrent. So secondly, the subject to tax rule is, uh, uh, we are proposing that the subject to tax rule be, be broad in scope, uh, covering all payments that are within treaties. And it seems that uh, at this rate, this is not going to be accepted because you could see there was a lot of uh, opposition. I just gave those as some of the key issues that really are teasing for, uh, for the developing countries and for Africa, but which uh, are not being looked at by uh, the developed countries. So the inclusive framework negotiations have made it clear that developed countries are not listening to the concerns of developing countries. So how are these similar to different uh, or different among developing countries? It is important to recognize that uh, not all countries have the same tax policy objectives or face the same administration constraints. In addition, not all developing countries are members of the inclusive framework. So it is important to consider what will happen for instance, when what, let's suppose that uh, there will be a global solution. So what happens to the other countries that are not part of the inclusive framework? It means they'll be, you know, um, putting into uh, law what actually they don't believe in, uh, and what is what may be too complicated for complicated for them to implement. And this uh, may have repercussions, like what Annette described, especially with the EU blacklisting process. So if you look at all that, uh, part of the support of what we have been providing shows that indeed uh, a fairer allocation of taxing rights was what was uh, desired and was what was viewed as stemming illicit financial flows, but the process doesn't seem to have this. So in that, there is a huge similarity. So what role, uh, I wanted also to look at the role that international standard setting bodies can play here. One for a start would be to try and uh, uh, understand that it is vital uh, that the role and influence of developing countries which are members of these bodies increases significantly. For a number of reasons, this is currently very challenging for developing countries with the limited capacity that Annette talked about. The global tax rules are also complex in nature, and we have been crying really for this simplicity, and we hope that this is something that everybody now understands as really critical if uh, there's going to be change. Uh, thirdly, there's the issue of uh, the soft skills. The soft skills, so these, most of this work is really specialized and the limited skills are now spending all the time in these negotiations or these discussions at the detriment of the audits back home. Secondly, there, there's also the issue of the soft skills that Annette talked about. And I can attest to this as, uh, um, uh, as somebody from ATAF, because we have been at these meetings and it is really complicated because um, you find that this is quite intimidating for most developing countries. And you find that they would rather not, in, not make any intervention for fear of being contradicted at best, or in, in even some instances, they are uh, directly attacked. And, uh, there are quite a number of examples, and when we have time, we'll be happy to share these. But what is clear is that people would rather give written comments as opposed to go into open debate, because all this is intimidating. And of course, the time issue is really, really complicated, because the, the rate is very fast. The volumes of uh, paperwork that have to be done are really, really heavy. And this is really complicating the, the whole process. And, um, uh, the international tax uh, issues that are supposed to be discussed cannot be discussed uh, uh, openly for these people because most times you find that uh, the developing countries are lagging behind. So some of the challenges uh, that we face, for instance, as ATAF in supporting the membership is that even as we provide this technical support, it is very difficult to keep up because uh, the members, uh, as we said, uh, have these capacity issues, have IT issues, they have all these 
complexities, and above all, they don't have the right, uh, the, you know, enough resources to commit to a process that is as complex as this. So, the, I, as Africa, we also have a key issue. Uh, and because of the country's uh, lack of policy direction, you find that people don't have a mandate to make any decisions at some of these meetings. So that is what we as ATAF are trying to do and to try and get some policy direction so that our members um, are then comfortable to articulate the issues that face the developing countries. So as we even uh, at ATAF, we remain committed to the process, but we are also optimistic that greater policy direction and political support would go a long way in helping, you know, developing countries and Africa in particular. So African countries can, can only, you know, get better if they coordinate and have a collaborative manner and have, you know, a clear policy direction that will not only get earn them more rights, but will also stop this illicit financial flows from clear and very specific laws that will, you know, support the process. So in the absence of these international taxation challenges for developing countries will remain real. I thank you. Thanks very much uh, for that intervention, Mary. I think that the, the two interventions together really illustrate um, the, the, the gap that currently exists between the formal institutions that we have, both in terms of the content of international tax rules and, and the way in which they're made, and then the practical reality that, that is experienced by developing countries, whether they're participating in negotiations or whether they are trying to make the best use of international tax instruments. Um, uh, and I think it's really good to have that practical perspective from, from both of you. Um, so I think that the other participants are now going to join us um, for a uh, for a broad-based discussion. Um, I'm going to begin to introduce um, our um, introduce our, our panel of illustrious uh, commentators. So here we have some of the brightest and best thinkers um, in the new generation of uh, international tax scholarship and practice. Um, and it's a real privilege to be chairing this panel. Um, so I'm going to uh, do my best to work through in the order that people that you can see people on the screen there um, so that we can uh, so that you can identify who people are. And then I'm going to um, begin a discussion on uh, on the basis of three questions, which I'll, I'll bring you back in just one second. Okay, so um, to the right of Mary there, you see uh, Diego Quinones. Um, uh, Diego is a partner at Quinones Cruz uh, Law Firm in Colombia, and he's um, recently completed his PhD in tax law at Oxford University. Um, then on the bottom left, you see um, on the next, sorry, on the next page, person to the left. Oh, it's Javier. My screen is so small, it's quite hard to see some of who you are. <laughs> so Jav, uh, next we have Javier Garcia Bernardo. He's a data scientist at the Tax Justice Network, and he's also just completed his PhD uh, at the University of Amsterdam. Um, next to him, uh, we have Emma Mosquera Valderrama. She's Associate Professor of Tax Law at Leiden University, and she's leading um, an EU-funded project called A New Model of Global Governance in International Tax Lawmaking. Uh, moving next, we have Joy Waraguru Dubai, Dubai um, who's a research associate at the VEU Institute for Austrian and International Tax Law in Vienna. Uh, next to her, uh, on the right-hand side of the second row there, we have Lucky Star Miandazi. She's an international tax specialist working on policy research and political economy analysis in Africa and Europe. Moving to the third row, um, the first person that you see there, um, is Natalia Pushkareva. She's a PhD candidate in global studies at the University of Urbino. Next to her, you see Tarsicio Diniz Malgalias, who is a lecturer in tax policy and taxation at the McGill University Faculty of Law. Next to him, you see Vidushi Gupta. Uh, she's a tax lawyer, policy analyst, and LLM candidate at the LSE. And next to her, on the right-hand side of the third row, there you see Leopoldo Parada, lecturer in tax law at the University of Leeds. And then all on her own in the bottom row, you see Ali Reedhead, who is an independent advisor on international taxation and the extractive industries, and she leads the tax and extractives work at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Ah, and now it's been moved around so that you see her bottom right. Great, okay. So with that, um, we have... Uh, about half an hour 
to cover three questions. Um, so I've asked all the participants which question they're most interested in contributing to. And so what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll give each person one chance to speak. And if we have a bit more time, then we'll have a bit more of a free discussion at the end. Um, uh, okay. So to begin with, our first question. Um, so the first question is, what are the issues and concerns related to international tax saving for developing countries? I think um, we heard a bit of this in presentations that we had from Annette and Mary, um, but I think it's also the case that to some extent they focused on the experiences of countries trying to uh, negotiate the landscape of international tax instruments. So if we move back a step and ask what the issues and concerns are um, and how these might be different or similar between different groups of developing countries, because as Michael Leonard reminded us earlier on today, developing countries is a monolithic term. And in fact, what we're talking about is a diverse group of different kinds of countries. Okay, so uh, the first person I'd like to, to, to ask to speak to this topic is Lucky. Thanks, Martin. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> Great. I wasn't expecting to be first, but my pleasure to go first. Uh, so some of the key issues, and uh, thank you to the speakers, to Annette and Mary and yourself for the for the brilliant introduction to the topics and always good to hear and learn more. Um, so some of the issues that developing countries face, especially at the moment, and has already been highlighted in general, is the issue of illicit financial flows and uh, this um, uh, on tax evasion and tax avoidance that takes place. And I'm just going to narrow that down to speaking about the um, Beki report, His Excellency, uh, former President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, led a high-level panel to look at the issue of illicit financial flows in 2015. And uh, uh, since then, they categorized, they were looking at how much Africa loses. And I think this is a very cross-cutting issue. So answering the next part of the question, which says how similar uh, the issues being faced by various countries in Africa are, uh, or developing countries in Africa. And that's, uh, that's my focus area. And so uh, through the report, they found that there's three ways, which is their commercial activities and uh, including abusive transfer pricing, trade misinvoicing, um, unequal contracts, uh, which is an issue of, of, of uh, uh, tax treaties, uh, criminal activities, which includes financial fraud, uh, organized crime, and lastly, corruption, which again, they said uh, is a cross-cutting issue. And we hear a lot about when we're looking at the issue of uh, illicit financial flows across Africa. And I think this is a huge challenge. And just recently now, first forward, from 2015 to 2020, uh, now we have UNCTAD that has just released a report um, last September, this September, which is um, almost like a few days ago. Um, and they also looked at the issue of illicit financial flows and come back with a figure uh, of uh, 88.6 billion annually in capital flight that Africa would have gone to uh, would have taken into investing in the SDG financing so I think this is one of the key issues that uh, that is a key problem and a challenge for African countries there's the issue of inclusive growth and tax competition uh, and the race to the bottom in terms of um, because we want to attract FDI we also want to reduce our corporate tax rates and this has been a, a problem for many of our countries and I think the rest I'll leave because they've already been highlighted the issue of administrations and capacity and the issue of digital economy Economy and taxing the digital economy. So yeah, I'll stop there, Martin. Great, thanks very much. Lucky, which would play that list? Which would you place as being the, the, the top priority if you had to choose one? Uh, in terms of the challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, I would definitely place the commercial uh, activities where we lose the most. I think uh, this is an area, uh, so I'm talking about abusive transfer pricing, trade misinvoicing, misinvoicing of services and intangibles, and unequal contracts. So those would be like uh, generally the commercial activities would be my first uh, priority for African countries to deal with. Great. Okay. Thanks very much for that perspective coming from the African context. Okay. So let's move over to uh, Leopoldo now, um, who is uh, in the UK, but I guess he's not going to give us a perspective purely about the UK situation. He's actually in my uh, my hometown of Leeds, I think. Oh yes, actually yes. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I, I have to say that that I tend to see the problematic of developing countries uh, from. I would say most of the problems that developing countries have, actually, they concede with, with, with the debate that is going on internationally. The issue, and the tricky issue, is actually that most of developing countries, they, they have this dichotomy uh, between trying to 
keep or attract foreign direct investment and at the same time uh, trying to to comply with international standards most of the time not to go uh, uh, into a qualification for example as a tax haven or any other pejorative way that that developing country can be mistreated and and but the approach that developing can have is, is substantially different. Just take a look at what's going on at the debate on the, globe, uh, uh, the global anti-base erosion proposal. Uh, we tend to discuss about minimum corporate income taxes, minimum effective corporate income taxes, in order to end tax competition. But the question is, is tax competition entirely undesirable for developing countries? Does it make sense for them to embrace uh, a minimum effect of corporate income tax, especially not only from a substantive perspective, but also from a, from a formal perspective with all the complexity that, that means uh, this, this new proposal uh, with, with the tone of unprepared tax administrations that exist at, at the level of developing countries. Um, uh, ultimately, we could also simply ask uh, why to focus so much on corporate income tax when uh, in most of developing countries the, the main source of revenues come from a discussion on consumption taxes. We haven't heard so much about consumption taxes so far. We, we tend to, uh, again, to, to, to have this uh, sort of uh, paternalistic approach uh, uh, with regard to developing countries that, that tend to disregard that this is a complete different reality for them. The same at the level of, of challenges uh, of the digitalization. Uh, we tend to pose the discussion between a, a global consensus that we don't know how much revenue will actually raise for developing countries. Uh, and on the other side, we say, well, the only alternative possible is a digital services tax. When again, we need to ask uh, ourselves, is that really true for developing countries, especially when this whole discussion is going on at the level of Europe? I'm not entirely sure that, that developing countries, um, they should really go into, the, into considering that the only unilateral way to, to face this problematic is a digital services tax. Again, there are other ways, consumption taxes, VAT. So this whole idea of, of, of trying to paternalize developing countries is necessarily what, in my view, uh, should, should stop at the international level and should actually uh, recognize that problems are similar, but the way of approaching the problems should actually be different. Okay, thanks very much. That, that's... Uh... Um, that's a different perspective from the ones we've heard so far, and I think we might return to some of those questions, those comments about um, both the importance of the corporate income tax and also about um, uh, about tax competition as the discussion goes on. Um, so let's move on now uh, to Diego, who's uh, down in in South America. Hi, uh, thanks, Martin. So I, I want to retake the issue of competition that that Leopoldo just addressed because I think that. Part of what happens is that developing countries tend to participate in these discussions and there's a degree of tokenism. Having a seat is not enough. What you need is decision-making power. You need the possibility to make others aware of your specific interests and issues, and that's a challenge. And you need a genuine interest by the organization to empathize and reach consensus-based uh, mutually beneficial solutions. So in terms of competition, if you want to talk about fair competition in terms of taxes, that's great. But you have to recognize that we do not have even starting positions. So if we're all in a race, we need to even out those starting positions. And then we can discuss uh, how the rules for evening out uh, the, the revenue or the consumption, as the Polo is, is mentioning, are going to be laid, laid out. So we do have to recognize that whilst we're not a monolith and there's differences between us, India is not the same as Colombia, it's not the same as Zambia, it's not the same as Eswatini, which was already mentioned. So uh, within those differences, you do have to realize that we have not, that we developing countries have not had the chance to benefit from an existing system of tax rules for so many years. When it's now being reformed, we are kind of being left out to suffer from that reform without uh, really benefiting. So if you've got globe, globe versus the pillar one, for example, on the one hand, you're telling me we want to give more to the market countries. And on the other hand, you're kind of erasing that by saying, oh, but via Globe, we're not only forcing you to have minimum taxation without recognizing your greater reliance on tax measures to attract FBI, whether that's 
efficient or sustainable is another debate. Uh, and you're also telling us at the end of the day, we're going to go residents on the globe. At the end of the day, the state that's going to keep that is the resident state. So I, I do think that the issue of competition is, is a huge challenge and perhaps the biggest one, because I'm not sure developing countries are uh, ending up winning in this debate. Um, that's that's questionable, I think. OK, thanks very much. Uh, Diego, um, really interesting reflections. Okay, and then um, let's move on to Tarsizio now, and then we'll go back maybe to, uh, uh, to to our speakers, see if they have any reactions. So Tarsizio, I think uh, you're in uh, Canada, so we're moving up to North America now. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much. The, so let me just start by saying that I, I, I agree with many of the issues that were raised before by, by the other commentators, and that this is a question uh, uh, that I've been trying to answer in my latest research on, you know, trying to identify what it is exactly that, that is the problem when it comes to developing countries and international tax. And I think, although I agree with many of the things that were said before, I think the, the focus should be much more at a, at a fundamental level of, of what it is exactly that these countries need to solve before they start uh, being able to tax uh, companies or whatever it is that we, that we want in the tax. So, uh, you know, I've tried to identify this at both the international and national level, and I think we have to pay attention to, to both levels at the same time. So when it comes to the national level, we have to consider that we have recent, for, so for, we have for decades focused on the idea that uh, we need to teach developing countries to tax. And this is, I think this speaks to what Leopoldo was saying about being paternalistic. And it's much more a matter of lack of resources than expertise itself. Um, we have to consider diverse tax structures, uh, you know, and this also, uh, Re, uh, refers to what Leopold was saying about you know the VAT and other other sources of, of taxation that, that these countries have focused on much more than developed countries. Um, policy priorities that are different, and here we can group things that were said before about IFF or natural resources or tax evasion. So these are, are issues that developed countries don't usually pay attention to. At the international level, we also have to focus on on other things. So uh, we spoke about tax competition. Tax competition is what we have to recognize is that this is a problem that is created by negative spillovers the result from policy choices that are put in place by developed countries. We know that developed countries, when they move to territorial systems, when they don't tax back a residence, when they when they, they adopt certain measures, they promote source source tax competition. So this is, is this something we have to recognize and have to pay attention to. Uh, and then, you know, uh, it was said before, the idea of misallocation of tax restriction, we have to stop with the idea that we can solve under taxation first and then move into uh, the allocation of, of taxing rights. One thing is connected to the other. Under taxation is a problem that is generated by misallocation of taxing rights. So this is something that we have to focus on. Um, and, and we have to recognize that it is the cooperation of countries, of all countries together, that allow for multinationals to create value, that allow for multinationals to profit, and to create what, what we can call, what I have been calling recently, cooperative surpluses so it is it is the cooperation of all countries that allows that and because of that we have to allocate resources among all of them in a in a in a fair way um, under representation in global platforms this is fundamental if we don't solve that we're never going to be able to to uh, get to a system that that, that is beneficial for, for developing countries too. So I think if we start focusing on all these issues we can get to a better place. Thank you. Thanks, Tassizio. So it, it seems to me that, the, just to come back to the, the tax competition point, that you your remark about the the shift to territorial systems in capital exporting countries being a driver of tax competition, that seems to kind of slightly um, uh, be resolved by some of what's being proposed in the Pillar 2 right now. So does that mean that, um, uh, in contradiction to perhaps what some of the other contributors have said, that you think that the impact of, of Pillar 2 on, on tax competition will be a good thing? Right. So, well, thank, thank you, Martin. So, uh, so this is the way that I see Pillar 2. Uh, pillar 2 is a way to allow for whatever is decided with Pillar 1 in terms of allocation to actually happen. So the, I don't see Pillar 2 as a problem in itself. The problem is that the allocation that we're doing under Pillar 1, um, and we know this, we know that the, that the unified approach doesn't really to, didn't really take into account the proposals that came from developing countries, is going to continue a trajectory of allocating more resources to developed countries. Pillar two is just a backstop. 
I, I see pillar two as just a, a, a form of cascading taxing rights that whatever is decided under pillar one, pillar two is, is going to make possible. So if we can fix pillar one in a better way and, and have a better allocation, then I don't see much of a problem in terms of pillar two. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so just before um, I come back to Annette and Mary, do any of the, of the other contributors want to um, make any make any remarks on this first question? Um, I think it's quite uh, good that we spend a little bit longer on this one just to make sure we've got um we've got through all the things we want to talk to so um in fact what we'll do is i'll first of all come back to annette and mary um because i think i need to ask you to communicate to me privately if you want to say anything um so uh so um let me see if Ma mary and annette would like to come back on any of the things that have been said here i think it would be interesting to hear um your reflections on this point about the policies of um capital exporting countries and the spillover effects they have on Developing countries, and also on, um, uh, also on the the issue of, of tax competition. Um, so uh, maybe we can have Mary and Annette back in the uh, in the video. Uh, yeah, can I comment? Yes, great. Thanks. Hi, Annette. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, okay. uh, I wanted to comment on the issue of direct and indirect taxes. I forget who who made a comment about the fact that uh, there should be some kind of uh, um, way in which we don't put a lot of emphasis on corporate taxes rather than and, and, and diversify and make use of indirect taxes. Uh, well said, and I'm aware there is an OECD report uh, statistics that clearly show that in some developing countries, uh, there is more revenue being collected from value added tax. and. Uh, but actually, when you look at a report that was issued by ATAF, on the ground, at least from an African perspective, some indirect indirect taxes are not really contributing that much for some uh, developing countries due to the low purchasing power and the low the, uh, and the big informal sector. You find that um, in many African countries, one, two, or three or four multinationals are actually contributing to about 60, 70, 80, even 95 percent of the total revenues that these countries are collecting. Such revenues from one multinational may actually be quite a drop in the ocean for big developed countries. But for small African countries, this is actually a lot. And for many of them, this is all that they rely on. And that's why you see the drive to push uh, the taxation, uh, uh, the corporate tax part of it, rather than emphasizing the direct taxes. Well, that being said, let me say something about uh, tax competition. And in that regard, I want to refer to the, um, the, the, the spillover effects that someone referred to. And for me, the challenges that arise out of here for, uh, for developing countries is that initially developed countries actually benefited a lot out of tax competition. And the whole idea behind Action 5 was actually to address those issues that placed initially lots of emphasis on tax haven jurisdictions rather than uh, tax competition among uh, uh, preferential tax regimes in in, uh, developed countries. So now they're setting up a minimum tax to apply to all countries, which will impact uh, in the guise of uh, addressing the race uh, to the bottom and addressing issues pertaining to tax incentives for developing countries. But actually, if you look at it in terms of participation and cooperation, it's not fair that they have benefited all these years and ahead of the curve, so to speak, and now a minimum tax has got to be set, which uh, becomes disadvantageous for developing countries and impacts on their ability to use uh, tax incentives, of course, within uh, within the guidelines, say, of the OECD Global Forum. Some of them have already been peer-reviewed in order to ensure that the tax incentives or the regimes they have are actually in line with international measures. So they should be laid, in my view, uh, with proper guidance and proper meaning 
imams on how they can use uh, incentives in order to encourage foreign direct investment. I think that highlights the first comment that I think the first speaker gave about the dichotomy that developing countries find themselves in offer foreign direct investment and yet at the same time have to deal with tax competition. Our challenges are immense and uh, maybe I'll stop here for now. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Annette. Um, just before we come to Mary, um, a couple of the other contributors wanted to come in. So um, let's do that first and then we'll let Mary have the last word. Um, so Irma. Um, I have two short comments. And the first one is one that we have not mentioned yet, and that is the informal economy. And looking how in developing countries this informal economy needs to be tackled and deal with. And the second one, and coming back to the tax incentives, but more important now with COVID-19, that we need to make sure what type of tax incentives. So it's not only about the BEP Section 5 or harmful preferential tax regimes, but it's also about the tax incentives and the policy making and what the countries need to introduce the tax incentives because they will still need it. So it, that's a little difficult right now. And those are the two challenges that are very important to keep in, to take into account. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, and next, Vidushi. Um, hi, thank you so much. I just want to quickly jump in. Uh, firstly, I want to point out it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanted to quickly elaborate on the fact that I think there's a lack of acknowledgement from these international organizations and also somewhat by developing countries as to why something like, for example, a Pillar 1 proposal is important to developing countries. Uh, my background's in India, so that's sort of the perspective that I'm coming from here. But I think it's really important to identify that one, the laws are inherently tipped in favor of the developed of the developed countries. That is the resident countries, which are, which are typically countries that have somewhat better infrastructure. That said, I think the fact that developing countries have made an undeniable contribution as far as the growth of the developing eco uh, of the digital economy is concerned, I think that's sort of something. Uh, that's lacking acknowledgement. I do want to sort of give credit where it's due. I do think that the amount of representation on this issue has been a little more. But as one of my co-panelists pointed out, it's been fairly tokenized or superficial in that sense. So some of the um, issues that are very intrinsic to developing countries have not been taken care of. For example, the reason why we're scrambling for resources at this point in time, the inequality that sort of exists in a lot of these economies as far as the divide between the rich and the poor is concerned, um, how difficult it is for infrastructural development and for uh, capability development, capacity development to implement a system as complex as what Pillow One, so, uh, Pillow One sort of proposes. That said, there is also no clarity on how much revenue one will actually get out of pillar one. So those are just a couple of points I want to quickly flag just as far as the lack of acknowledgement of some of the challenges and some of the policy issues that are relevant for developing countries. Great. Thank you very much. So let's just go to Mary to conclude this first uh, part of the discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. <clears throat> and thank you to all the speakers. I just want to say three things. The first is the issue that was mentioned regarding the, the DST, the digital services tax. And uh, I think the speaker said that uh, it wouldn't be really advisable for people, not, for countries to have these unilateral measures. But I just want to pose a question. Now, in the absence of a global this, uh, you know, consensus, in the absence of a global solution, what happens? Do the countries continue to lose revenue? Because uh, think about COVID and look at how we are managing this meeting. Under normal circumstances, we'd be together. But right now, we are all using this technology. With all these different platforms, the only thing that's working right now is what is digital. So now, there are no laws to tax this. Even the little that would be coming in cannot be taxed in the absence of laws. So when our membership came to ATAF and requested that we develop a uh, a model, a suggested approach to help them draft this legislation. We thought it, you know, it made sense because, and uh, we thought that actually, uh, much as it was complicated, it was really uh, part of a solution. It could be a solution, but will this work? Well, 
everybody's afraid of sanctions, but I think this is where people should come together and, you know, uh, and fight for their rights. The second issue that I wanted to look at, Martin, is the issue of taxing rights. And I want to make a point here because some of it, I don't want to call it, uh, for lack of a better word, some of it is a bit hypocritical. On one hand, we're saying we cannot live on aid forever. On the other, everybody who's providing that aid is not ready to cede taxing rights. So how are people ever going to get these taxes? So I think these are some of the issues that we need to raise out there. We don't have to use very complex technical terms. We just have to raise the issues as they are. The third issue is about under having a seat is not enough. I really loved that expression. Having a seat is not enough. How that seat is used is what really matters. So as we said, as Annette said, and as I will repeat, yes, we have people there. Right now we have 25 members of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the inclusive framework coming from Africa. But how much do they get to say? How much influence do they get to have in here? So under-representation is real. And I, for as long as nobody uh, is listening to the developing countries, it will continue to be, un, uh, you know, uh, unbalanced. And I just wanted to, you know, to end on that note to Martin. So, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that's been a really interesting first part of the discussion. Now, what I'm going to do is unilaterally make a change, which is that we're going to um, address the next two questions combined. So, uh, so the, the, the rest of this discussion now, we're going to look at um, the role that international re and regional bodies can play. So looking at those two things, uh, in the interplay between them a little bit, um, rather than looking at them separately. Um, so uh, let's begin with um, Virushi on this question. So what, what is the role that international tax standard setting bodies and regional bodies can play? And what are the challenges uh, uh, in terms of addressing these issues that we've just been discussing? Um, as I said, I think previously as well, I think one of the biggest things that can come from international bodies is a acknowledgement of the unique issues that developing countries face as compared to say their developed counterparts. Uh, number two, I think deep and meaningful uh, representation from developing countries as opposed to just a seat, which is something that we already discussed. Uh, I think genuine collaboration is something that's really missing. And again, just to sort of say I'm extremely optimistic that this will get better in the future. And uh, to echo what was just said about, about unilateral measures, I think while I agree that they're not the ideal solution, I think they're definitely something that's sort of driving the conversation and bringing developing countries' concerns to the forefront, at least on the digital economy uh, taxation issue. Um, so yeah, I think I think I'm going to stop here. My two broad points are number one, give us a deep and meaningful representation. Number two, acknowledge that we face specific issues. For example, the proliferation of cash transactions, the unorganized economy, the large rich and poor divide in most developing countries, the capacity issues. Uh, I think an acknowledgement of these unique issues is really important. Great, thank you very much. That's that's a really great starting point for this discussion. So let's go from India to Africa, and uh, well, not to Africa, but to in fact back to Europe. But someone from Africa, which is Joy, from Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the first question I would, well, I would kind of switch your question around a little bit because I want to ask you which bodies are we talking about? Um, obviously, the dominant body has been the OECD, and if we're talking about the OECD we must also understand the mutually reinforcing relationship with the EU. And for that, I have one or two answers, right? Uh, first is that uh, compliance with norms uh, should, be should not be enforced upon countries that are capacity constrained. It doesn't make sense to be listing countries that have capacity issues together with countries that are genuinely engaging in harmful or abusive behavior. Um, when we begin to implement or, or evaluate standards as if all countries are equal and the same, it means that the system that's being implemented can never be fundamentally fair 
right? Because we're not really considering the actual uh, challenges, the needs, the capacities of the countries that we are evaluating. And on that, I would actually add that perhaps we need to reevaluate something like the Doha development agenda and think about what special and differential treatment could mean for developing countries. And what that could look like would be perhaps regional organizations taking a stronger position in evaluating their own countries since they probably have the tools, better understanding as well. Um, the second point is actually addressing the, appropriate, the appropriateness of the norms and the standards for all. Uh, as uh, Vidushi has pointed out, we now need to question uh, whether these are contextually relevant. There are different needs. Uh, different needs are also different development uh, asymmetries and different information asymmetries that need to be addressed. So when we talk about utilizing exchange of information uh, reports or country by country reports, the capacities are different in Austria in comparison to Kenya. And I think the recent report uh, from the Global Forum on Tax Transparency in Africa has revealed that, that they are not able to utilize as much of this information and it, it might not even uh, produce the same returns as what's being invested in those tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, the third thing is that we need to acknowledge the unique solutions emerging from developing countries. I loved what uh, Mary was saying because I was just thinking, you know, when we talk about the digital economy, we're always saying, yes, we need to provide these solutions for Africa, but can we begin to evaluate what solutions they've developed for themselves? Uh, as much as we view, for example, the over-the-top tax in Uganda as inappropriate, it is a solution. It is a response. In fact, a, a response that quite, that's quite interesting because they recognize we can't apply a direct tax. It's very difficult for us to access the companies, the digital companies. So what do we do? Let's focus on the individuals. Let's focus on the indirect solutions. We have a lot of excise duties being used. We have South Africa applying the value added taxes. Can we begin to evaluate first what is on the ground before we begin to implement very complex solutions? The final thing I would say is simplicity. And Mary really put this well. Simplicity is the most important factor. An increasingly complex system is going to create increasingly complex conditions to comply. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joy. Um, okay, great. And now we are moving uh, a small distance from Vienna to uh, Amsterdam and to Javier. Thank you, Mar Martin. So my expertise is on corporate tax avoidance, so I'll focus on that and the OECD. And I think an important thing to realize is that corporate tax avoidance harms every country, but especially so developing countries. Developing countries lose the equivalent of 50% of their public expenditure on healthcare because of tax revenues due to profit shifting. And in contrast, only hiring home countries lose only 4.5% of it. And, you know, 98% of these profits shifted are shifted to high-income countries. And I believe that inter international organizations, in theory, could have a role addressing this particular issue. However, I'm not convinced that the output of, of these organizations will reflect the interest of developing countries. And in the specific case of the BEPS plan, Annette and Mary and also other speakers have, have gave a good summary of the challenges of the process and especially insisted on the underrepresentation of developing countries. And yeah, as a result, the current best proposal is highly complex and is also highly inefficient. The OECD itself expect, expects that only 20 to 35 percent of the profit shifting will be stopped because of the best proposal, um, up to 5 percent with uh, the pillar one, which is you know, nothing, and the rest with pillar two. And, you know, this is really problematic. And Pillar 2 establishes a minimum tax rate. So if a firm pays less, that pay less tax in a country that that minimum tax rate, the tax is, that is due is paid to the shareholders. But, you know, who are the shareholders? They are not the developing countries. If you have an American firm that uh, seek profits from, let's say, Nicaragua to Bermuda, then the tax that is due is not going to be paid back to Nicaragua. It's going to be paid to the U.S., and, you know, since the minimum tax rate will be probably between 10 to 15 percent, uh, the multinationals will have a huge incentives to keep shifting profits to Bermuda. 
and the US will have huge incentives to not stop this because it's benefiting them. So yeah, in summary, I'm unsure to what extent international organizations can fix profit shifting out of developing countries, unless developing countries are not only involved, but they are also in power. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. I think it's interesting we've had two presentations now from people based in Europe in a row, both of them uh, shining a light on the policies and the interests of European countries and kind of questioning uh, questioning the, 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 the strategies and, and, and approaches that they're taking. Um, so now we're going to go, I think, to Italy, where maybe Natalia, we'll see if Natalia will have the same perspective. Uh, thank you, Martin. Actually, I'm in Moscow and it's quarter past uh, midnight here, so <laughs> I'll be very quick. <laughs> uh, uh, I think what we need from the OECD, first of all, is representation on fair and not equal footing, because treating unequals equally doesn't make them equal, obviously. It only increases existing inequalities. So there was a lot of discussion recently about Pillar 1 and how it fails to account for difference in sizes of economies, in structures of an economies, in roles that countries play in some global supply chains of multinational companies, for example. And here, what we need is to actively listen to developing countries instead of paternalizing them, as previously was uh, said by multiple participants. But what I also wanted to say is that probably it's about time we treat it as a systematic, institutional uh, problem as a matter of institutional design, as a matter of how OECD develops its agenda and how the internal policies allow it or do, do not allow it to include developing countries in active conversation, not just sitting at the table, but actually being heard. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. And uh, one way to do it is to request more transparency from the OECD, I think, because just last week, I think, I was listening to this podcast by, uh, of Financial Times, where Pascal said that transparency will kill all the negotiations. And I think I quote. And I remembered constantly a famous quote by a famous Russian politician who said like five years ago that parliament is not the place for discussion. Let's say I disagree with both statements strongly and find them quite disturbing. I do want OECD to be that transparent structure that has no secret negotiations, no replacing documents with their changed versions. We need as much transparency as we can reach if we are talking about democratic institution that is supposed to really represent everyone. And I hope that's where, what we are aiming at. So yeah, I'll stop here if you allow me. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. I hope that uh, Mary and Annette, you're taking notes because there's some uh, good things to, for you to react to when we come to the end of this session. So um, we have two more people to make their contributions and then we'll come back to uh, Mary and Annette to, to conclude. Um, and the first of those people is Ali. Thanks very much, Martin. And thanks uh, to everyone for their really excellent contribution so far. So I think that the question that I was going to respond to, uh, what are the challenges that developing countries face in uh, supporting regional and international cooperation? Uh, and I think for me, stepping back, and a few people have touched on this is, Firstly, I think we need to be realistic about what regional and international cooperation can achieve. And secondly, I think we need to also constantly be checking ourselves to make sure that uh, regional and international cooperation isn't just reinforcing existing global norms and standards that uh, perhaps don't benefit developing countries. So obviously it's important to be part of the conversation and to contribute and to, uh, to engage earnestly in these processes. But again, bearing in mind that uh, we need to be careful that it doesn't end up being to the detriment of developing countries or functioning to, to reinforce some of those norms and standards that perhaps are not in developing countries' favour. Um, and sometimes it might be all right for developing countries to go their own way and pursue their own policy goals and objectives, uh, even if that is contrary to, to uh, international or regional cooperation, if that is the best thing for, for that country based on its needs. And I think Mary also touched on the issue of COVID. Uh, right now, uh, developing countries are facing significant challenges, and that might mean that they uh, make particular policy choices that are 
uh, in conflict or contrary to some of the efforts at the regional and international level, and and that might be the right thing to do at this point in time. So I'm not I'm not trying to pour cold water on cooperation, but I think we need to be make sure make sure that we're not just pursuing cooperation for the sake of it, uh, and that it is actually working in the interests of countries that are particularly vulnerable. Um, and the last couple of reflections is insofar as is supporting regional and international cooperation. I think it's, some of the issues are around prioritisation. So it's, as been mentioned, often the priorities identified by regional and international groups are, are not necessarily those that are the bread and butter issues facing developing country tax administrations. So we, someone I think spoke about property taxes and VAT and mineral taxation, which is the area that I work in specifically, where these are really um, important issues that tax administrations are dealing with on a daily basis that are not international tax for the most part, uh, and they deserve attention. And so making sure that there is alignment and that these uh, regional and international efforts actually, uh, that their priorities and their goals resonate with the experience of developing countries and what it is that it's important for them and that they see will be um, significant in terms of improving domestic revenue mobilisation. I think recognising um, also just lastly uh, the issue around competition, which again has been mentioned, which is, you know, we can't escape the fact that even at a regional level or perhaps especially at a regional level, countries are in competition with one another when it comes to attracting investment. Uh, and so, you know, which is why we don't necessarily get a lot of traction when we talk about things like tax incentives at a regional or international level, because ultimately countries don't really want to try and reach agreement on those sorts of issues because they see them as a impo important policy lever. Um, whether that's true or not, of course, is is questionable. And, and certainly in, in the mining sector, we would discourage com countries from using tax incentives. But that is to say that cooperation is difficult because competition uh, is, is also in the mix and we need to be, again, I think, realistic about what cooperation can achieve and make sure that we're not uh, pursuing it to the detriment of developing countries. Thanks, Martin. Thanks very much, uh, Ali. Um, great to have a perspective thinking about the extractive industries there too. Um, okay, um, and let's uh, go finally to Irma, who's been waiting patiently. Yes. Um, I think that there are three questions that also need to be addressed if we take a step back. And the first one is why countries participate, who participate, <laughs> and why countries comply. And when you look at that, and you look at the role of the international organizations, also the supranational organizations, and also the regional organizations, you may find that in some cases, for instance, the ones why the countries participate is because there are incentives, for instance, technical assistance, the training projects, and so forth. So there are incentives for developing countries to participate. And sometimes they were saying, like in meetings, well, actually, what I want is the toolkit on tax treaty negotiation. And if I get that one, then I will be okay. And the other question is who participate? And there is also a problem, especially in developing countries. And the reason is because sometimes you may see that it's of the person from the Minister of Finance, of the person from the tax administration. But both of them are different. And sometimes you come with the Minister of Finance who says, actually, we are going to participate in BEPS. But the other, the, the tax administration say, we shouldn't do, be doing that. So the question is also coordination and who participate and how this becomes a political or a technical issue. And the third part, that is also what we are doing in this project of global tax governance, we are also looking at the implementation of the BEPS for minimum standards. And we are looking in 12 countries and some countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and Europe. But one of the questions that we have there, and what I have come up with is, and since almost more than one year, is why countries comply and whether we can make this instrument of compliance, then the peer review, an instrument not only for compliance, but for learning and contextualization. And here is what is important about the regional organizations because the regional tax organizations can help to contribute to a change of best practices. And if you look at the work, and actually Ali has been also working with ATAF and with SIAT, I have been working more with SIAT than ATAF. But when you look at that, you look at, there are still difference. And of course the NTO, the, uh, uh, the network of tax organizations is helping towards that. 
but it will be also interesting to go more towards uh, that exchange of best practices. And the final point I have is the role of the EU. Because as Professor Guto mentioned, the EU is also now pushing countries who decided not to participate in the BEPS inclusive framework, not only to participate, not only to prepare review, but to receive a positive peer review. And that's a problem. Because, of course, there is AU development funds, and of course, there is AU trade agreements, and there is an incentive there. But why we are going, the EU is going beyond this and saying you have to participate and also you have to be positive per review. So those are questions that we also need to address. Thank you. Mm. Thanks very much. Um, uh... Okay, now I had one person wanting to just chip in. That's Lucky. Uh, Lucky, you can have 30 seconds, but then we need to go to Mary and to uh, Antoinette. I wanted to say that it's about uh, implementation and uh, implementation of policies because one time, I don't know who I'm quoting here, but there was a minister who once said, Africa is not short of policies. So by us suggesting the introduction of more and more policies, and uh, Joy alluded to the fact that ETF has a policy on uh, DST, for example, right now it has a... a support African countries to actually implement these policies rather than go and implement uh, the ones at the OECD UN level. So what are we doing to implement the ones we have in Africa? Thanks, Martin. Thanks. I think that the internet heard you advocating DSTs and decided to interfere with your intervention there. Um, <laughs> great. Okay. Um, so um, that's been a really rich discussion. And there's a lot to, to capture and react to. Um, and let's come back to uh, our two main speakers. There's a few interesting things that would be interesting to, to hear, hear back on, really. One is, I think, the tension between unilateralism and 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 cooperation cooperation for the sake of it some uh, i think it was ali said um so how should how can countries strike that balance um another is um uh can we what can we really expect of the oecd and the eu countries can we really expect them to 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 play fair to, to concede the things that developing countries want how, how can we really deal with what seems like a real clash of clash of interests. Um, those will be a couple of themes of what's been a really rich and, com and complex discussion. So feel free to talk about those or anything else that you, you want to react to. So let's begin with Mary. Thank you, Ma <clears throat> Thank you Martin, and uh, thanks to all the speakers. I, I was really scribbling away because uh, people were saying very interesting things, and uh, I really love this group. But I just wanted to say uh, two things. Uh, in regard to what Ali said, about um, also looking um, at cooperation uh, more, um, you know, we, you know, we're looking at cooperation not for the sake of just cooperation, but looking at what can be gotten out of it. I'll just give an example. When you look at what happened um, with regard to unilateral measures, for instance, the issue that uh, that France put on the table, everybody at the in the EU then came on board and started saying, OK, if there is a problem, we're going to, to side with France. So I'm not saying that the other countries should take that one as well. But cooperation sort of gives um, strength. It's uh, when we go, for instance, for the, and, and Ali, you know this, when we go for these meetings, for instance, as an inclusive framework, and we give a position, even when the position is dis is advantageous, you know, to the developing countries. You find that if we do not get support, the idea sometimes falls through the cracks, even if it is as meaningful, you know, as as can be. But what happened is uh, when we started talking to these countries and giving them some of this uh, of this technical support, the countries then started putting their flags up, and a few things have been accepted. I don't want to mention them because I don't want them to be taken away because we are still negotiating. So I think cooperation sometimes, it does work, at least in the case of developing countries. I think, uh, you know, it helps. Secondly, I liked what uh, uh, Irma said, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name right, about who attends these meetings. And I wholly agree with you because it is something that I've observed through the time, you know, I've been at ATA. And I noticed that, I'll give you an example. One time we, were, we had a meeting again uh, of the inclusive framework. And there was an issue that we had to deal with. And um, the issue had been dealt with uh, in working party seats. 
and there was no agreement. Actually, the, they just didn't even listen to the speaker. And we were so, so particular about it because we wanted an African example included. And so when I went for the meeting of the inclusive framework, we then uh, tabled this issue. And the speaker looked at me and said, how can you bring this here? It was already discussed in the working party meeting. So, you know, everybody looked at me like, Mary, you, you know, you don't want to go into this battle. And I put my, our flag up again and I said, yes, we are observers, but my understanding of this meeting is that we are here to address what is going to give people better rights and what is going to enable countries to tax better. So is it just to endorse what is done in the working parties or do we have to apply our minds to it? Well, later on the issue was resolved and we actually did, you know, did, uh, did get our position accepted. But why am I saying this? When people attend, uh, sometimes you find that some, the people from ministries of finance and they have not been, you know, really involved in these issues. And so you find they can't, uh, you know, contribute much. Or the other way around. So I think even for the developing countries, it is important, and that is what we are trying to even convince the different countries, that it's important for us to make sure that the right people are on the table so that they can articulate these issues. So I really couldn't agree with you more. So thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Mary. And let's uh, let's go for the final word to uh, to Professor Agutu. Uh, thank you, Martin. Very, very interesting and thought-provoking ideas that you all have. I feel like I could get all your brains and put them in my head. <laughs> but I've been very, very uh, amused by your discussions. Now, what I wanted to pull out of the discussion is the issue of coordination. Must we have coordination, shouldn't we, at international level? The reason I'm bringing up this is that we seem to have um, some kind of silos, if I may put it that way, if you look at the would-be norm setters under the OECD, EU quasi, and then the UN. What is actually happening here? So we all have the inclusive framework taking place. And then there is a side thing happening with the UN that is coming up with Article 12B and the digital services. And of course, getting a lot of support from the G24 and India is pulling a lot of its weight there. So what, that's why I'm asking now, um, should we have coordination of what's really happening in all these bodies? Should we have one overarching body? Or is it okay that different bodies can set different norms to speak to their co 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 constituencies? That is one of the concerns that I'm having here. And it has been an underlying problem that has created a dichotomy for developing countries, especially when it comes for uh, with the UN Motor Tax Convention and the OECD Motor Tax Convention. Ultimately, the UN is supposed to be in favor of developing countries, as we all know. But then when it comes to negotiating power, and you have a more powerful party coming to negotiate a treaty, they'll of course come and, uh, and, and pull their cloud and have the OECD model as the one that is negotiated. And uh, the give and take discussions that go take, take place in that regard will result in the developing country actually, actually accepting a lesser position when the treaty is negotiated. So now we look at a situation where the likes of Article 12B, the digital services that the UN is trying to negotiate, may be advantageous to developing countries, but is it something that we are going to take on? That's an issue that maybe we should look into. Then when we look at the point of um, regional bodies, I think for me, this play a big role in implementation and understanding the international framework. I can only speak for my constituency, and in this regard, ATAF, I think, has played a very big role in that such a regional body actually understands the challenges of the countries concerned. It can come up with tailor-made 
approaches and fit for purpose uh, 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 approaches for the countries. We've just talked about, uh, 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 or Mary has just talked about, it of his suggested approach for taxing di the digital, for on legislation for taxing uh, um, digital sub for digital services tax, sorry, for the mumble thing there. But anyhow, it shows uh, the role that such regional bodies can play in making sure that they are tailor-made approaches and that there is a united voice when they go to such organizations or sit in such uh, a meeting, such as the OECD or the UN. Those are some of my views on the topic. Thank you so much, Annette. Thank you to all of you. This has been super interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed everything that you've had to say. It's been great to have people from so many different countries and continents, and, and it's been really useful. So um, with that, I think we have to conclude. We are um, a little bit over time, but I think it's been worth it. So thank you, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs>